It is July 6th, 1989, the last meeting of the Warsaw Pact. In the room are significant figures of the Soviet domination of Central Europe, the Soviet ambition to take over Europe in the room. One man more important than any other is Gorbachev. Gorbachev is now the head of the Soviet Union, and he's also a man who's, who's supervising the Warsaw Pact. The Warsaw Pact is made up of countries such as Romania, Yugoslavia, Poland, East Germany, Czechoslovakia, and most importantly, Hungary. Because also in that room is a man named Nemeth, a very young prime minister born 1948, for what is also in the room, the leaders of other countries in the Warsaw Pact. A man named Ceausescu, the absolute dictator of Romania, is pounding the table and yelling at Nemeth, yelling at him, accusing him of betraying the socialism of the Warsaw Pact, accusing him of undermining the power that they possess to protect their people from the predatory capitalists across the Iron Curtain. Telling this story is Matthew Longo, assistant professor of political science at Leiden University. The book is The Picnic, A Dream of Freedom and the Collapse of the Iron Curtain. But we begin with the villains in the room. Matthew, a congratulations. This is a brilliant telling of a story I had no knowledge of. Who is Nemeth? Who is Ceausescu to yell at him? And what does Nemeth make of Gorbachev in the mo at that moment? Good evening to you. Good evening. Thank you. So to, to further on this stage setting, what Ceausescu represents in a way is the old guard, someone for whom the Warsaw Pact and the whole construct of the, of the Soviet empire was in a way a boon. This is a person who never had no desire for change, no desire to see anything about either liberalism or democracy creep in across the Iron Curtain. And what you had with Nemeth, so, so and I, I should mention that he's in Romania, which is the border um, to Hungary's east. Nemeth is a younger man. He's actually the youngest prime minister um, in the Eastern Bloc and the second youngest in the world at this point in uh, July, 1989. He's an upstart. This is not your classic Eastern European leader. He's young, he's intelligent, he's trained in, in economics. He had a fellowship at Harvard. And he sees the writing on the wall in Hungary. He sees an economy that's collapsing. And he, he wants something of liberal democracy, something like a multi-party state. He realizes the trajectory Hungary is going on is unsustainable. So you have Nemeth as the reformer in the room and Ceausescu as the old guard in the room. The reason it's so loud and so violent with Ceausescu banging on the table, uh, one of my favorite anecdotes of this moment is Ceausescu refuses to address Nemeth as comrade. He addresses Nemeth as mister, right? He doesn't even give him the dignity of being a socialist at the table of socialists. But the reason what Nemeth is doing is so radical, as opposed to what is happening in Poland, okay? Because Poland was also a reform state at this point. Hungary and Poland represent the most progressive wings uh, and Romania, let's say, is the least progressive wing or so. What Nemeth is doing that's so radical is he isn't just reforming Hungary. He's trying to chip away at the Iron Curtain itself, which is to say he's chipping away at the authority of all these states, including Romania. So Ceausescu is threatened and scared. So the only person in that room Nemeth can appeal to is, of course, the only person more powerful than, than any of them, which is Gorbachev who was a reformer himself, head of the Soviet Union. Nemeth looks at Gorbachev. Does Gorbachev look back? At one point in the proceedings, Nemeth is terrified. He doesn't know how this is going. He doesn't know where it's going to end up. As it already had happened, he had to sleep outside in a tent because right. his men had gone into the hotel early to find that there was, a, there was too much radiation. In other words, there was a, there was a plant to kill him to expose him to the kind of radiation that would be deadly. Nemeth knew he was on the edge and knew his life was in, was in danger. At one point, the proceedings get so hot, he looks, he looks at Gorbachev. And Gorbachev subtly, quietly, does something so incredibly profound. He looks back at Nemeth and he winks. 
He winks in a way it's subtle, looks like just a little twitch of the eye. No one else in the room picks up on this. But Nemeth knows it doesn't matter what Ceausescu says. He has someone to protect him that's way more powerful. They've met before in 1984 when Nemeth was working in agriculture and so was Gorbachev before his elevation to be the leader of the Soviet Union. And Nemeth had an audience, supposedly 15-minute audience, in the Kremlin in early March of 1989. It went for two hours. And what came up in, in addition to the men disagreeing about what needs to be done to reform, what came up is Nemeth wants to take down the Iron Curtain. What did Gorbachev make of that? Yeah, it's a terrific meeting and a terrific moment in history, which was, of course, at the time secret. Um, but now we know the details, uh, in part because of my own interviews with Nemeth, but also in part because of the public record. Yes, they went in, they disagreed ideologically about change. They're both reformers, but the disagreement is important. Uh, Nemeth actually wanted to see a post-communist Hungary. Didn't mean a purely liberal, purely democratic Hungary, but a post-communist Hungary. He, he saw that the economy had to be reformed in a liberal direction, and he saw that the state had to reform in a multi-party direction. That was not what Gorbachev had in mind. That was not what Perestroika, for example, meant, um, or Glasnost meant to Gorbachev. But despite that disagreement, the Iron Curtain was something that Nemeth was quite adamant about had to change. The reason is because the actual technology of the curtain, the actual lines and wires and mines and, and electricity and all the different aspects of the Iron Curtain were decades old at this point and become had become basically ineffective and had become too expensive to maintain without reforming. Nemeth put the bottom line to Gorbachev and said, look, we can't keep this. We want to turn the electricity off. Okay, we'll keep our border. The border stays shut, right? It's not an open country. But the fencing that made the Iron Curtain so deadly, we're not going to pay for and Gorbachev looked back at Nemeth and said, well, that's that's your problem, right? If you want to do that, I, I won't stop you. And so Nemeth left Moscow with this incredible green light. So what he started doing immediately is making plans to start to reform the Iron Curtain, in particular, taking away all the fencing, all the electric electric current that made it so deadly. And this is the beginning of the great era of change in Hungary. Suddenly, the Iron Curtain, the mighty Iron Curtain, in a matter of months, became reduced to a border like any other. One detail. Nuclear weapons. At that meeting with Gorbachev, there's a dramatic moment. The music comes up, Matt. <laughs> Gorbachev says, everybody stop taking notes. What does Nemeth learn? So Gorbachev's principal concern is the nuclear arsenal in Hungary. Now, Nemeth was the prime minister. Nemeth didn't know there was a nuclear arsenal in Hungary, nevertheless where it was. And it was, in fact, ironically, uh, so the meetings in which I'm meeting Nemeth and during our interviews take place about 20 kilometers away from where the stash was outside Lake Balaton. Uh, what Nemeth wants is a with small withdrawal of, of forces. And uh, Gorbachev is happy to do this. So Nemeth can come home with a sort of a little show of, of success. You can say, look what I told you. Know, I met Gorbachev and now there's a smaller Soviet army. There had been hundreds of thousands of uh, Soviet forces on Hungarian soil. But what, what Gorbachev wants is there to be absolutely no mention of the, the nuclear program in Hungary because he knows if any of this got out to his own defense ministers, he'd, he'd be destroyed. And in fact, what we learn from that meeting isn't just how important, how sensitive the nuclear question is for Gorbachev is that we learn how delicate his own seat is. The main take home that Nemeth has from that meeting isn't just that he can start to dismantle the Iron Curtain. It's that he's scared, not that Gorbachev will stop him, but that Gorbachev's seat is itself too hot and that someone will stop Gorbachev and some hardliner will come in. And that's not just the end of Gorbachev. It's the end of Nemeth also. The book is The Picnic, A Dream of Freedom and the Collapse of the Iron Curtain. It is late June 1989. Several months have gone by since the meeting with Gorbachev. Prior to the Warsaw Pact meeting, we're in a city, the second most populous city in Hungary, I learned, Debrecen. 
Uh, Von Habsburg is in the room, a man who is part of the European Parliament, but he's addressing a gathering of young people in a party that sees itself as opposition to the Communist Party dominating the conversation. He inspires the people in that room, and one of them is Neji. And several days later, people in Debrecen will say, we must do something. We must act in a fashion that is consistent with our wish to be free. And a young woman named Maria speaks up with a plan. And the plan is to hold a party. Help me understand, Matt. I don't know the geography. How far is Debertson from the border? And how is it that uh, Maria comes to understand that is the soft place for the for the party? Yeah, fantastic. So we're now in late June 1989 in Debrecen, right? So these two things that that John is referring to, this is June 20th is the beginning of this idea, and then June 30th it starts to form. Uh, to understand and to appreciate the whole context, one has to completely change their register of thinking. We're no longer dealing with elites, right? This is no longer Nemeth and Gorbachev and Ceausescu names that we know, very high-powered political figures. We're now out in the borderlands. To give you an idea of where Debrecen is, Debrecen is a, you know, a 20 minute drive from the edge of what it was then the Soviet Union, right? So now it's Ukraine. It's absolutely at the edge of the Romanian border and the Ukra now Ukrainian, then Soviet border. And the people we're talking about are just kids, right? I mean, they're, they're either late twenties, let's say, some even early thirties, but they're people who are um, young, uh, uh, the two main actors, so Ferenc, and Maria, these two figures, uh, begin to hatch this idea that, you know what, we can talk about issues. We can do something radical and strange because they're at a moment in their lives when, in a way, change is all they can look forward to. You have to imagine if you're not an elite living out in the, in the bush, right, out in the borderlands, you can't imagine democracy. You can't imagine liberalism. It's impossible to think that one day there wouldn't be a Soviet Union lording over you. And there's a kind of, well, when you, when you have nothing to lose feeling that governs their actions, because they do feel as if there's nothing to lose. Communism had taken away their youth, right? And they have this idea that says, well, we're 400, you know, we're, we're 400 miles. We're now a six hour train ride away from the Austrian border, the border of the Iron Curtain with the West, which at that point is Hungary, Austria. But let's do something. Let's not just talk about things. Let's talk about things, meaning European togetherness and freedom and all these great ideas at the border. And it was a wild idea. Ferenc first raised it. It went nowhere. It's absurd. How could you possibly throw a party at the Iron Curtain? This incredibly, like devastatingly dangerous place. But that's right. Uh, this young woman, Maria, said, well, I'll help you. Let's try to plan it together. And together they form basically the nucleus of a team that says we're going to try to throw a party protesting communism, protesting the Iron Curtain at the Iron Curtain. It's an incredibly audacious idea. Yes, so much so that Maria finds a way to get on the phone. I learned from Matt that there were very few phones in Hungary. Bizarrely, that was an understanding that the leadership had, that it would keep people happy or they wouldn't cause trouble, whereas the phones were tapped and all the other Warsaw Pact state. So Maria gets on the phone and starts making phone calls, including to the government. And at this point, we, ha we have to set the geography here. They identify a place called Sofron. And Sofron is at the frontier uh, next to Austria. It is in a forest, largely, and there's a lake nearby where there's a campsite. Mm -hmm. And now we go to a man named Laszlo Neige, I hope I say it right, Matt, not Laszlo Neige, and you're meeting with him after you first learned of this event. This event was not is not in the history books. Matt has helped us understand something inside the fact of Hungary itself that is important to understand because the leadership had ideas, but they didn't act on them. What acted on them were these young people. There's a lake, there's a campsite. And what was Maria's original vision? She lives on the other side of the country. She'd never been there to my knowledge. Yeah, precisely. So 
the way Hungary works, uh, there's Budapest in the center, is the capital. And all the other cities, even relatively large cities, are basically peripheral. Uh, and it's quite normal for people in the peripheries, meaning people like Ferenc and Maria, who are out in Debrecen, to visit Budapest. But the idea that you would visit another periphery very far away in a time without easy transport, without basic communications, uh, was was more or less unheard of. It was quite rare. So they had never been out there. Instead, they communicate with people out in the borderlands uh, because the, by phone, by trying to say, we need someone in this town of Chopron that will help us. But the idea that Ferenc and Maria have, uh, it's it's profound in its in its ignorance in a way, because their idea is to throw a party, and you can imagine like a fence. Their dream is to invite Austrians who would come up to the fence. They could pass uh, sausages through the the chain link. You know, they could they could toss beers over the fence to one another. It was a completely um, silly, but almost euphorically so plan. It was the product of ignorance and youth and excitement, but also activism, the belief that if you want to change the world, you do it. And so they had this idea of this very thin fence. Actually, the borderlands looked totally different. The Iron Curtain was not a fence. The Iron Curtain was basically a several kilometers wide zone of many levels of fence, of, of, of uh, electric fencing. It had been in the past mines, most of them in Hungary had been cleared at this point, uh, in part because border guards kept dying. Uh, they've got all these different layers of watchtowers and dogs and soldiers and tracks. And uh, the Iron Curtain is essentially a several kilometer wide death zone. You can't throw a party at the edge of the death zone and see anyone in Austria. I mean, they're kilometers away. And so they actually have to go and figure out how to make a party. But as it turns out, the project of unrolling uh, oh, sorry, of de-electrifying and then rolling up the actual Iron Curtain was quicker than they expected. By the summer, a lot of it had been cleared, including around Chopron. But more importantly, this particular area, uh, they were able to get in touch with the border guards. And they were able to get in touch with the authorities above the border guards who allowed a one-time only crossing. So Austrians could come in to the Iron Curtain and but celebrate with the Hungarians. Let us go to the event itself, Matthew Longo, the part, the picnic. The masters of Central Europe, the Warsaw Pact, are not present. We're going to a campsite called Ferto Rakesh. It's on the edge of a lake that extends from Czechoslovakia uh, and also reaches into Austria. This is the borderlands between Hungary and freedom. The, the town nearby is Sofron, Sofron and the gathering at the campsite are people from Czechoslovakia, from Hungary, and the East Germany, known as the GDR. Those are the most important of all because they are the most oppressed of all. They passed through Czechoslovakia and camped at this place for a celebration that is to take place August 19th. It is the night before. It is August 18th. Matt, what is the expectation of the next day when Everybody gathers for the party. So it's a particularly fraught moment. In the government, in the halls of power in Budapest, you have people sitting by the phones, terrified that the Soviets are going to move. Someone is going to shut everything down. All the organizers are terrified, so much so that Maria, who had been on the phone with the border guards, had been planning things for, for, for uh, weeks at this point, even the day before, August 18th, still calls the border guards just to check the border stays open because she didn't entirely believe it would go off without a hitch. You have a lot of tension in the campsites. So there's a very, in this story, the, the focus is on a particular campsite, which uh, John mentioned, outside Fertorakos, which is filled with East Germans. These are East Germans fleeing the GDR, which is the, the socialist half or the communist half of what is now unified Germany who under the leadership of Eric Honecker had become one of the most constrained states, uh, very tight in its controls. But even that spring, people in East Germany had begun to receive some news that there had been some work done on the Iron Curtain in Hungary, that the electric uh, fencing had been rolled up, that maybe, just maybe, it would be possible to cross. So by August 18th, that summer, Hundreds of thousands of East Germans 
had come to Hungary, uh, pretending to be on a summer vacation, although I guess many of them were on summer vacation. Hungary is a lovely place to visit. But most of them at this point are there as refugees. They're there trying to get out, hoping that at this picnic, at this party at the border, there might be a chance to break free. So at the campsite, you have this mixed energy of excitement and terror. You don't know what's happening. If you get caught, people were already trying the border and getting caught quite frequently. You'd often be sent back to the GDR or at worst, uh, at worst, uh, um, uh, slightly less uh, terrifyingly, you'd be put in a Hungarian prison. Um, but in either case, your name would be written down, your passport would be taken, your details would be taken. Uh, these are people, in a way, excited because of the possibility of freedom, which at this point is kilometers away. But on the other hand, terrified. They know what's happening um, out in the woods if they don't get through. And there's just this feeling that maybe at this party, there will be a special chance because they know the border will be open because they know Austrians will be coming east into the party, the party in the borderlands. The set is an opera. Wandering through these tents are Stasi informers, men who are associated with brutality and murder, mass murder. Wandering through the camp, they recognize them by their clothing, by their attitude, by their treatment. The East Germans recognize them. No one else fears them anywhere close to these Germans, and yet they stand firm, knowing the Stasi are taking down their names. It's it's it's. At this point, Matt, I was following your story saying, I have no idea what happens next. I don't know whether they're going to, there's a photograph that suggests something's going to happen, but you're not sure whether the Stasi are going to pull their weapons out. Now, the information about what was going on is also in Budapest. They, they understand the campsite is meant for something beyond just a demonstration. What does Nemeth know at this point? of what's going on at the campsite. Well, ne so Nemeth is aware of what's happening with the picnic and the, the reformists in government see the picnic as an opportunity because whereas they're trying to test Gorbachev to see what they can get away with before the Soviet Union reacts, uh, they've been quite careful in what their risks are. This band of kids who are throwing a party. Remember, it is literally a party. There is a, a stage they build by hand. There are porta potties they build by hand. There's musicians coming in. There's going to be food and alcohol and dancing and merriment and all these things Nemeth knows because the Soviet army base is 30 kilometers away. They're watching the Soviets and Nemeth views it uh, in a way it's not, this is a, an unkind way of saying it, but in a way it's Operation Human Shield. As far as the Hungarian government's concerned, it's a test. If the Soviets don't even respond to this, they're thinking, who knows what we can get away with? Who knows how much further we can push reform? Because actually, the Hungarian government is aware that there are tens, if not hundreds of thousands of, Hung of uh, East Germans perched, camped out at the border, waiting for a chance to break free. The Hungarian government can't order this. They can't say let them through. But they can certainly uh, hope that at this great chaotic moment of merriment, uh, something might happen. There are families who are looking to make a break. There are couples from both sides of the border looking to make it possible for, in one instance, a young woman from East Germany to make a break. There are young men, two in particular, the Naglers, who may or may not make a break. They're not sure. They haven't quite told their parents. And then there's one extremely mysterious figure named Norbert. Who is he, Matt? So one of the great things about historical research is not just that you find the names no one's heard of that they should have, people like Nemeth, these powerful figures that are kind of lying in the archives, waiting to be discovered. But you also find these incredibly strange people these radical nobodies that at some particular moment in time become heroes. So Norbert was a West German. That detail is really important. He had a West German passport. He was allowed to go East. The Iron Curtain was a, was a one-way street, right? There was no problem going from West to East. You just couldn't leave. You couldn't go from East to West. Norbert 
was the kind of guy whose uh, breath stank of whiskey at 10 in the morning and his car was filled only with empty boxes of Galois cigarettes and uh, scotch whiskey and all these things that if you're a, a little boy from the East, as the Naglers were young teenagers, it's un it's impossible to state how powerful is the cool of this guy who he had a knife. He's covered in scars. He had been in, in combat. He'd been a mercenary in different wars. He has been part of the French Legion. Norbert comes in and has no fear. He has the right papers. He can cross however he wants. And he basically says, I can figure this out. You're, you're scared of going into the borderlands, all of you East Germans who are terrified? I'll help you. And he becomes basically a shuttle, a shuttle figure, along with this woman, this elderly woman named Agnes, who the two of them, Agnes, because she's so old, she's not concerned the state's going to hurt her. And Norbert, because he's from the West and knows the state can't hurt him, in a way become these fearless strange figures that just in a way almost like guardian angels helped people find a way to cross there's supposed to be a setup and there's supposed to be a moment of celebration they've changed the lock on one small gate at the border itself and there's supposed to be dignitaries and remarks and the original concept of sharing brotherhood and sisterhood across the barrier but then on the day itself, August 19th, something panics the Germans. What is it, Matt? Well, what happens in the morning of the 19th, uh, so you have all this information about the picnic. But the picnic, remember, the picnic is a party thrown by the Hungarian activists. Nobody necessarily in the camps even knows what this is. And there's this fear that actually it's a Stasi ploy, right? That it's not the young Hungarians we know that it's basically this great party to celebrate freedom. But the actual picnic is received incredibly as, as dubious information. There are flyers, not just in Hungarian, also in German. Why are there flyers in German? If you're an East German who's lived their whole life terrified of the Stasi, and in fact, in the story, there's lots of examples of people falling into the traps the Stasi set. Stasi, quote unquote, human catchers or people catchers. So a lot of people are scared that the picnic is a ploy. Some go and say, you know what, let's figure it out. Maybe there's a chance at this crazy event to just try the border. But others say, uh, no, this doesn't smell right to me. Remember, these are people. These are not elites or soldiers or these are people with kids, right? A lot of the kids in the story are five years old or seven years old, and they're scared for their lives, for their kids' lives. And so the actual feeling on August 19th in the morning is one of absolute panic. And a lot of the figures I interview, a lot of the stories that I try to track across the border are people that didn't cross at the picnic because they were so scared. Right. It gives you a little bit of the climate. They come to the border. There's uh, guards are there. And the gate opens. And then there's the pop of a champagne cork is, is how I heard it, Matt. This is a re one of your readers. And that sets off this bolt through the fence is a photograph that describes the moment of panic and the look on the faces of the of the of the parents. I believe there's one young woman pushing a stroller. I'm not sure. It's a cluttered picture. <laughs> it's a very chaotic moment. Let me let me let me set the stage. So of the people that go to the picnic and we're talking about, uh, we think between 600 and 1200. So a little under a thousand, let's say, decide to go and try the border at the picnic. This is a mass of bodies. It is a hot, wet day. The party actually, like Woodstock, gets rained upon. Uh, the picnic is huge. In the end, 20,000 people show up. It's a chaotic scene, but the, but the border is still protected, right? The fact that people can cross from Austria does not mean the border is open. It is protected by armed guards. It is not an open border, and it is certainly not an open border for East Germans. Nonetheless, this mass of people push their way they're 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 like they're 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 walking then suddenly they're running and they see a fence and there's these two perspectives to imagine the one perspective is just the people who are running and running and running this horde of bodies pushing up against a fence breaking through this fence and suddenly hearing the popping bottles of champagne they think it's over they think they're being shot at right they think they're going to die but actually it's just austrians saying welcome to freedom, 
you've made it. Like people are hugging and there and there's champagne flowing, this incredible moment of euphoria. But the other perspective to imagine is the Hungarian border guards who are watching this mass of people coming at them. They are supposed to stop them, not just stop them. They have arms. They should be shooting in the air. They should be threatening them. They should be doing something. But these are part of the, the heroics of the stories. These Hungarian guards don't. They actually decide not to do anything and they let the mass through, partially because, and this is what's so interesting morally about the story, these are people who have spent their lives defending the, Hung the Hungarian communist state, defending communism, but they too are aware that communism's collapsing, that the Iron Curtain is folding. Are you really willing to kill, to threaten the lives of people, but ultimately to kill, to defend a system you're not even certain is even going to be standing in a few weeks, in a few months or so? And so they make this tremendous moral choice to look at these people, again, as John put out, these are people with kids, with prams, um, and let them through. And so you have this moment, not just of euphoria, but also without a drop of, of bloodshed. The book is The Picnic, A Dream of Freedom and the Collapse of the Iron Curtain. Matthew Longo is the author. 30 years later, there's a celebration for that moment of August 19th, 1989. What's happened immediately after in domino fashion, the Iron Curtain countries fall. The Berlin Wall, which is everybody's memory, is November, early November that year. Ceausescu is executed by his own military on December 25th of that year. Gorbachev hangs on for a little bit longer, but the Soviet Union dissolves at the end of 1991. It is now 30 years later, and our intrepid professor scribe, researcher, Matthew Longo, is visiting who remains, Nemeth for one, Agnes for another, who remains to remember, and Lazo Inej, the man who is the unelected curator of documents from that moment, and led Matt first to the border. So I'm interested to go to the border with Matt today, to this, to the spot itself, and what does it look like? I imagine it looks like Woodstock, which is you can't tell. What does it look like, Matt? Yeah, precisely. So the one thing, and this is a, a perverse irony of, of the Iron Curtain. So for, for so many decades, the Iron Curtain was an area where there was no development, that all there ever was was fencing and, and landmines and, and so, but there was never any kind of industry and there was no settlements. That now the Iron Curtain is the most green part of Europe. In fact, for a lot of it's now a big uh, green zone. It's called a green belt because it's just essentially woodlands. In Hungary, when you go to the site, what you see is the overgrown woods, the very woods the East Germans tried to pass through, this incredibly scary uh, dark wood at night when they're fleeing essentially armed guards, now is just this beautiful pastoral space. It's hills, it's pastures, it's, it's, it's trees, uh, but it also has no sense of carrying this mark of history. And so uh, Laszlo has this profound way of referring to it as Anus Mundi, uh, which if I, maybe I cannot translate on the radio, um, but is the uh, the anus of the world, is how he describes it, this place that's completely unremarkable and hidden into the, into the bushlands between states in the peripheries. You would never know that it held this powerful story of not just the party, but again, all these people's lives risked and some taken, right? And some killed um, as they went for freedom. Your conversations 30 years later reflect on two understandings of the word liberty. You mentioned that you teach Isaiah Berlin and you teach Hannah Arendt in at Leiden University. One is negative liberty, one is positive liberty. Help me understand that. Yeah, I'll, I'll, let me let me put these two thinkers together, because I do think a lot of the point of the book is to rethink what we mean by freedom, because one of the profound things about the story is that, in a way, 1989 is the most clear exemplar of what freedom can mean. People going in a literal, crossing a literal threshold from unfreedom of the East to freedom of the West. And yet, as we know in the present, it's not as though since the collapse of communism, 
right? It's not as though at, since the, the, the boom days of globalization, uh, it's gone particularly well in terms of what liberalism and freedom mean. We now see rampant inequality. We see xenophobia on a, on a terrifying scale. And we actually see a world in which walls are being built back up. So we have to take this moment to ask, how did we get from that incredible moment, that powerful moment of freedom in 89, with that, that exemplar, that image of the Berlin Wall falling as the most clear sense of what freedom can look like to our present in which freedom is embattled? We should take this moment both to rethink freedom and to look back at 1989 and ask how we went wrong. So the two people that have helped me think through this are Isaiah Berlin and Hannah Arendt. In a very uh, quick treatment, the way Isaiah Berlin talks about freedom, he's helpful because it's the way that we usually speak about freedom. He's canonical in this sense, which is to say that he's defending what is called, as John pointed out, negative liberty, and this idea that you want um, the kinds of freedoms we think about in the West. It's not just democratic freedoms like the freedom to vote. It's also the kinds of freedoms that mean freedom of movement. We have one minute. one minute. Go ahead. Okay, freedom to travel. and uh, uh, But also all this, so just think of the kinds of freedoms we think about in the West. No, no state is going to stop you, right? You are free to do as you will without the state encroaching upon it. And yet one of the powerful, and that's, let's say that's the canonical way we think about freedom in the West. But one of the, the great parts of the story is to hear the experience of East Germans who made it West and actually were very disappointed by the kind of freedom they found, in part because... It was missing the element of solidarity they knew in the East, solidarism, community, which also can mean something like equality. They had thought the West had both of these properties, not one, not the other. And Hannah Arendt is the other pole in that thinking, who talks a lot about this question of plurality, this very famous quote where she says, the problem of freedom is that not man, but men inhabit the earth. And thus freedom has to become an idea in which we can uh, include the freedom of others, not just the freedom of the self. And there's this problem of the way we think of freedom in the West that a lot of these stories hit upon. The book is The Picnic, A Dream of Freedom and the Collapse of the Iron Curtain. Matthew Longo is the author. I'm John Batchelor.